student notebooks as sources. Okay. For the history of Renaissance pedagogy, um, it's a topic, uh, uh, as I told you, that has been at the center of my studies since uh, 15, 20 years. And um, I more often not worked on neglected sources. And these sources are either uh, teacher's notebook or student uh, notebooks, uh, like the one I'm presenting you on today. Uh, this is a book from the um, a manuscript from the uh, Biblioteca uh, uh, Laurenziana, uh, Strozzi 54. You see the uh, Foglio di Guardia here with the title and uh, then uh, uh, the name of uh, Senator Carlo di Tommaso Strozzi 1670 below which uh, testifies of the long, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the fact that this manuscript was uh, uh, handed down by uh, several scholars until it finally came to the, to its own, uh, to, to, to the Florentine library. So uh, just uh, to start, uh, uh, I would like to share with you some basic uh, information for those of you who are not very much into Greek learning in the Renaissance, uh, which you can find uh, summarized uh, in a paper I published a couple of years ago, three years ago, in this uh, uh, nice uh, uh, collective book, Cahier de Collier à la Renaissance, uh, where I uh, reflected upon uh, a selection of sources, some manuscripts, uh, uh, sources which are mainly student notebooks, uh, all uh, composed and written between the 80s and the 90s of the 15th century, all belonging to the uh, milieu of the University of Florence, the Studium Florentinum. Uh, so this is, these are important sources because uh, we, do not, we, not, we do not have many other sources to uh, study, to, to understand how the, uh, Greek, the teaching of Greek and of classical languages was held in uh, uh, contemporary universities. Because of course we have uh, uh, treatises on uh, how to teach, for instance, the Ordine Studendi, Acto Cendi by Battista Guarino, but these treatises are more, more often than not concerned with lofty ideas and uh, do not provide us with uh, details on the real content of these uh, les of lessons, on the methods employed by, by the teachers and, uh, and so on. What we know about uh, uh, the, the general uh, general features of these courses is that uh, students in Greek were not as many as uh, uh, as those in Latin or other other topics, and uh, of course they they had to start from scratch at the university level the study of grammar. So they mainly used some grammar which were composed by Byzantine emigre and uh, for the use of Western, Westerners, uh, such as uh, Chrysoloras and, and, uh, and others. And then they, they started to uh, read short texts, such as uh, prayers uh, translated in, into Greek, uh, prayers in Greek, to they, they had to translate into Latin. And then they, they passed on to uh, shorter uh, and easy texts such as the Aurea Verba of Pseudo Pythagoras, the Sententiae of Pseudo Fossilides, and so on. After this uh, uh, introductory course, which may, uh, which, which, which we cannot say how, how many years. Uh, um, 
uh, it, it, it took, but uh, after this uh, introductory course, they, they, passed over, they passed on to the uh, prose author. So uh, in a sort of climax or gradatio, they, they started learning Aesop, Aesopus, then Xenophon, uh, Lucianus. Uh, and so they built up with their uh, syntactical, linguistical, grammatical uh, knowledge. Uh, at the top, there were the, the most uh, difficult uh, classics like Isocrates, Demosthenes, Plutarch, uh, Aristotle, Thucydides, Plato, and stuff like that. Of course, there were also, uh, of course, they, they, they read also poets and especially Homer, uh, Homer was uh, read in parallel with Virgil, more, more often than not. So they, they read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey in parallel with the Aeneid, and then the uh, Hesiod and the works and the Iophidiod compared to the Geor Georgica and so and so. Uh, what was the principal scope of these uh, courses? Uh, the advanced courses uh, aim to uh, uh, acquire, uh, aim to uh, build a competence made of uh, um, a vocabulorum copia. Mm? They they should uh, they should acquire as much uh, as much vocabulary they can in order to be able to be independent uh, uh, in the reading of uh, of of, uh, of the classics. Uh, in theory, uh, at the end of the of the course, at least this is uh, what Battista Guarino tells us, uh, a student would be able to translate uh, from Greek to Latin and vice versa. But I'm quite sure this is this was not the case. Uh, at least, uh, if not for some uh, uh, for some exceptions. One exception was, of course, Angelo Poliziano, who became able to write. Uh, poems in Greek, right? but it was uh, the exception and not, uh, of course, the, uh, the normal. Um, because when, when we come to these notebooks, we see a um, completely different panorama than uh, what uh, we could argue from reading these treatises on uh, Renaissance uh, uh, pedagogy. Let's come, let's, um, let's, let's come to, our, to our notebooks. Uh, as you see, uh, this is the first page of our Florence manuscript, and, and you can uh, immediately uh, observe a key feature. There is no Greek. Hmm? They were studying on Latin textbooks, the on the translations, on the texts, on the, of the Greek texts the, the professors were, were teaching on. So uh, another key feature, which is not um, very much evident in this case, perhaps, but uh, in other notebooks I've been studying, for instance, this one, is that, that uh, mostly the same handbook passes from a, a student to another. So we have uh, the same notebook uh, being annotated by more than a, a student, uh, possibly the, the members of the same uh, family. This is a very interesting uh, example of a, a manuscript on um, of the Iliad. There are two books of the Iliad translated into Latin. The translation is a rewriting of the old translation by Pilatus, a very bad one and very literal. And then you have a, a selection of um, several annotations, either in both in the margins and in the interlinear. And in this case, because it is, it is often the case, uh, uh, students uh, give us an important uh, chronological annotation. Uh, someone, one of these students annotated on the top, on top of the margin, a DM uh, sextum januari ad lulum ready, uh, 1488. Uh. I was back, I came back to school eh, on, uh, on the 6th of January, 1488. But let's come back to our, uh, to our Florentine, uh, Florentine uh, manuscript. Uh, this is uh, 
A Latin this Latin translation is the one which was made by Leonardo Bruni from uh, Arezzo. Uh, this is, of course, uh, um, that does not does no need to, to say that uh, the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, this book, uh, this text, was at the very center of the educational program of, uh, of the humanist, of humanism. Uh, this has been uh, studied very well, very well by Jill Gray, David Lyons, among others. And I refer you to uh, their studies. And, uh, the, the translation by uh, Leonardo Bruni, uh, which uh, was made more or less uh, about uh, 1416, 1417, and circulated uh, from uh, 1418 on, uh, soon became the standard uh, school version uh, school, uh, of, uh, of Aristotle. Um, it's more or less the case of Pilatus' old translation of uh, Homer. Everybody criticized it, but they kept using it uh, as a school, as a, uh, as a tool for, for reading Aristotle at school and, and outside the school. Um, so, uh, what about this? So, uh, and we have, uh, and we have, of course. Uh, uh, several witnesses about uh, this translation being used uh, in courses uh, by famous professors in the 14, in the 15th century, such as Ugo Benzi, Nicolò Tignosi, Francesco Filelfo, uh, Marsilio Ficino, John Argiropoulos, and Angelo Poliziano. Uh, let's let's come to our manuscript. Our manuscript has been. Uh, studied a bit, has been uh, surveyed by James Hankins in uh, um, an article on the ethics controversy in 2003. And uh, he provided a very short description of this manuscript, which he defined as a complex and fascinating manuscript. Uh, he also provided uh, a transcription of some uh, marginal. Uh, what, uh, uh, who's the, who was the owner or one of the owner of this uh, manuscript? It's stated here uh, in the lower margin of uh, folio uh, one recto, where you see it's, uh, sorry, it's a uh, signature. So Agostini, Agostini Nettucci at Amicorum, who was, uh, uh, Agostino uh, Nettucci. He was Agostino Vespucci, born Nettucci. Uh, it's a name he resumes uh, uh, after, from uh, 1518 uh, onwards. He came from Terra Nuova Bracciolini near Montevacchi, which is close to Arezzo. Hence uh, is a surname of Terriculus. He, in one of the notes, he signs himself as Terriculus. He studied, he studied law in Pisa in the 80s. He moved to Florence, entered uh, the service of, uh, with Antonio Vespucci. In the early 90s, he attended Angelo Poliziano's courses at the University of Florence. How, you, how we know this? Because he, uh, because it, he's, he, he write it, it him, himself in this, uh, in this uh, manuscript, we will see. Uh, from 1494 to 1517, uh, he worked at the Florentine Chancery as a clerk, then as secretary, then as a secretary to the ambassadors, uh, which allowed him to establish a close friendship with Niccolo uh, Machiavelli and to mix with statesmen, popes, humanists, and so on. Uh, then he moved as a diplomat in Spain. Uh, where he stayed from 1513 to 1516, and wrote this uh, work, the Situ Longitudine Forma e Divisione Totius Hispaniae Libellus, which has been recently edited by Gerardo Gonzalez, uh, Gonzalez uh, Germain. Um, so I just uh,
Okay, and here we have uh, his uh, uh, another annotation of him. This is the, the very end of the ethics, folio 71. This is a particular, and he writes here, Recognovit Augustinus Terriculus ex lectura poliziani viridocti anno uh, 1491 and 1492. Uh, we know from uh, the registers of the Florentine studio and other sources that indeed Poliziano uh, devoted uh, the university courses of his last three years uh, because he died in 1494, uh, to Aristotle. Uh, um, and this is indeed uh, uh, very important, uh, this note, because uh, he clearly uh, locate uh, this series of marginalia and annotation, at least the major part uh, uh, of, uh, of it. What does, what can we, uh, what can we uh, infer from these uh, from these uh, notes? Well, indeed, we can we can uh, see that uh, Poliziano seemingly adopted the same method of his own teacher at the Florentine studio, the Greek uh, emigre uh, John Argyropoulos whose courses uh, Poliziano attended as a youngling in the, in the 50s, because as a Giropoulos, he uh, also explained or read to his uh, uh, public, to, the, to his audience at the studio, the Nicomachean ethics uh, with the intermediary of the standard translation of uh, Bruni. Indeed, he proposed lots of uh, corrections to this translation, which you find uh, mainly here, either in the interlinear or in the margins. We will see uh, this uh, uh, later on. And uh, Poliziano's teaching, or at least what we can see of Poliziano's teaching in these notes, uh, is mainly concerned with the literal clari with the clarification of the translation. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to uh, ameliorate the uh, translation by uh, by uh, Bruni, and this is indeed uh, something uh, that that can be uh, observed also in other students' recollect which have been studied by. Uh, by James uh, uh, Hankins. I refer to the recollected or the annotations by Benedetto uh, Colucci in a manuscript now held at the Biblioteca Universitaria di, um, di Bologna. Uh, the, the scholar or the philologist interested in uh, Greek language, Greek grammar in the evolution of uh, uh the competent the in, in the study of uh, the very competence of these uh, scholars in greek grammars of their uh, usage of uh, lexica sources uh, etc uh, might be disappointed in uh, reading these notes because uh, the exegetical notes are very rare huh? there are uh, uh, um, schemes, diagrams, uh, for instance, uh, this one, oh, here you find the translation of a portion uh, of the first pages, folia um, eight recto verso. Uh, here on the left column, you have the Greek text, which is of course uh, uh, not uh, uh, comprising in the manuscript. Then you have the translation, and then you have a selection of the interlinear uh, or marginal glosses. Uh, they are mainly uh, uh, they are mainly uh, synonyms. So uh, bonum quodam peter videtur is glossed vel ad bonum quidam ferri videtur. Differentia discrimen operationes operatio. Uh, 
And then there's something more, sort of uh, uh, schemes or diagrams or aid memoir. There's a sort of uh, recapitulation of, of to what uh, philosophy is and of the branches of philosophy. You can see here, triplex philosophia id est, que sequitur mentem platonica, que sequitur fantasiam pythagorica, que sequitur opinionem aristotelica. Uh, and then he quotes Pico, uh, Picus Mirandulanus, eh? per argumentazione sorum trium semper procedit Picus ipse mirang, mirandula. And it's, it's very likely that this comes from Poliziano also because, uh, you know, they were close friends, Poliziano and, uh, and Picus. And then there's something which uh, has been mentioned yesterday in one... Uh, I, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Platonica digna rest sed minus certa Pythagorica betur media Aristotelica minus digna sed uh, certio. Uh, what else can we find in these notes? We can find uh, observations uh, which are not really related uh, with the text uh, or its uh, interpretation. For instance, loci simines. Here and in other instances too, you have uh, quotations from uh, Dante's, Dante's uh, uh, Divina Commedia. Here we have, uh, you, you see a reference to a passage from, uh, uh, from uh, Dante's uh, Inferno. Uh, somewhere else uh, you have uh, uh, observations on, uh, for instance, some, it, it's very interesting because um, on, occasion, on certain occasions uh, there are uh, information on what's happening in the universe, at the university, uh, apart from this very course. For instance, when commenting on uh, um, uh, a passage of book seven, uh, Aristotle is talking about uh, a cat, Galen, and, uh, Polish, and, Poliz and Poliziano, uh, as we can uh, see from uh, a marginale by Nettucci, uh, promises that it will be reading soon the, the work on, on animals by Aristotle. This is indeed uh, an, uh, an unedited information. We didn't know Poliziano uh, uh, lectured on, on this, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, Aristotelic uh, work. And then uh, some other passages are uh, interesting because uh, uh, Aristotle gives uh, the clue to Poliziano to uh, treat about uh, vices. For instance, when Aristotle um, talks about, uh, tells about uh, uh, gluttony or cruelty, uh, there are examples of, of uh, paradigms or embodiments of these virtues uh, taken from the contemporary contemporaries such as Donatello, eh, uh, which is mentioned as a, as a glutton, or uh, Filippo Lippi, the, the, the painter, and uh, as, a, as an example of uh, Sanguinarius, a uh, cruel man, very cruel man, he quotes uh, Tamerlanus. It's very interesting. I, I discovered it indeed yesterday when, when uh, uh, looking at the manuscript. There's also a um, a note in the same hand referring to Dux Valentinus, filius molestissimi et incestuosi pape, uh, which refers uh, to Cesare Borgia. And, there's, and then there's a date, 1501, uh, which uh, demonstrates that uh, this is not only uh, a student notebook, but a book that stayed in the library of uh, uh, Agostino Nettucci, and then perhaps he kept annotating uh, even uh, for a longer period. Uh, in this case, he referred um, in, in, in a way that we, we do not understand very much, but he associate, associates a passage of Aristotle to contemporary history, to 1502, uh, the, 
the raising star of Italian politics at the time was Cesare Borgia. So it's very interesting also from the historical uh, point of, uh, uh, of view. But indeed, as you see, uh, uh, these notes contain mainly uh, reformulations, clarifications, uh, something uh, which is lacking also is the absence of any deep uh, discussion on the philosophical message of the uh, of the text, also on this uh, on its uh, moral value. Uh, uh, often, its moral value uh, value is uh, sort of uh, banalized. Um, Poliziano or, or Nettucci himself uh, annotates uh, proverbs, sometimes in vulgar and uh, vernacular. Uh, for instance, in the, marge, uh, in the margin, um, in a passage concerning the uh, seventh book of uh, the Ethic, he, say, he writes, absolver non si può chi non si pente. Eh? One cannot uh, forgive, uh, it's not possible to forgive who uh, is, does not repent. Or more interesting, eh? sometimes eh? there are uh, um, references to uh, Latin authors. For instance, uh, Horace, but the majority of them are historians. Uh, and I guess, uh, not because Poliziano only quoted passages from historians, but uh, because this was a, a specific interest of our uh, student boy annotator. Huh? Uh, I just show you, uh, but I do not comment on some examples of schemes, diagrams, which are frequent uh, in all student notebooks. Uh, and then I would like to show you briefly the transcription, sort of kind of a diplomatic or presentation of what you find here at uh, folio 28 uh, verso. It's a passage from a book for Nicomachean uh, uh, Ethics uh, 1125AB. Um, Aristotle is talking about uh, vanity, smallness of soul, and then uh, here it, start, it starts with ambition, proper ambition. Uh, what you find in this uh, passage are uh, alternative translations, and these are all the uh, uh, notes in red that I write here. I don't know whether you can really see something or, or not, but there are very often synonyms. Uh, and then you have alternative translations from others, eh, from Argyropoulos here and here. I think it's very interesting these uh, annotations, because here uh, the, the text talk about uh, ambition, and uh, it say, Aristotle say, says, we blame a man as ambitious uh, if he seeks honor more than uh, it is right, mm? or from wrong sources. We blame him as uh, unambitious if he does not care about receiving honor even on noble grounds. Mm? This is the uh, context. Uh, when uh, coming to the very word uh, ambitiosum, uh, Poliziano, or say the teacher, but it should be him, uh, had said something concerning the difference between the two uh, adjectives, philotimus, uh, that means uh, ambitions, and aphilotimus, meaning uh, lacking in ambition. Uh, as you see, or oh, uh, you, you can see perhaps um, that uh, Nettucci, for this time, uh, tried to uh, write down the words, but he's very, uh, 
being not a Hellenist, he, tra he transliterated the text. So there's Philotimo uh, in uh, Latin script. Then there's a Kai. Uh, uh, he was able to write Kai in Greek, and then Aphilotomos, which is not, which is a box nearly uh, in. in uh, Hello, this, this uh, uh, is one of the very few uh, um, annotations concerning Greek, uh, Greek uh, words and Greek, uh, and Greek uh, passages. Uh, so we have the... Um, what I, I, I printed in blue, what I would... Uh, uh, Catalog as notabilia, uh, virtus in nominata, uh, which is the virtus which stays in the middle between ambition and uh, its opposite, and then habitus sine nomine qui medietas est. Uh, medietas is Polizian's uh, correction for uh, Bruni's mediocritas. Uh, and then we, you have, sorry, and then you have. Uh, here, uh, an interesting uh, parallel passage, uh, locus similis from uh, Salustius, uh, uh, who's talking about mansuetudo uh, in oratione catonis, so in the speech of Cato in the uh, Catilina. Uh, so you have uh, mostly either alternative translations or notabilia or parallel uh, passages. Uh, one should not be uh, astonished or impressed or surprised to uh, see uh, that uh, these uh, notes lack a lot of information that we expect from a course in Greek. Uh, there's always I've been I, I noticed here in other on other occasions there's a huge difference between the professor's preparatory notes, for instance, here you have his uh, orthograph notes on Homer's Odyssey, and the notes of the students they attended this his very courses. Here you have for every single word in uh, Homer. Uh, a full uh, full list of parallel passages, um, lexicographical information, all the scholia, uh, statues, uh, uh, commentaries, and so on. And then you see uh, the manuscript we, we already uh, saw at the beginning, and uh, uh, you can you can uh, you can observe that. Only a very uh, few uh, remarks are um, handed down, are written down by students. These, these were students of Greek, we can infer it because they can at least write a bit of Greek, but they surely did not read, uh, write down all uh, that bulk of information that. Uh, uh, you see here. There is, of course, another uh, explication for the another explanation for this. Um, on the one hand, the fact that the audience of uh, a course in Greek was very uh, varied, and there were, uh, um, of course, uh, advanced level students, but also students uh, uh, who were. Uh, sort of debutant. Um, and on the second hand, um, it is possible, uh, and it has been suggested for other, for other courses uh, by Politian, for instance, by Jill Craig, that uh, I quote, Poliziano was unwilling to cast his pearls of wisdom before swinish undergraduates and therefore reserved his most dazzling philological insight, whether castigaciones or interpretaciones, for a more discriminating audience of scholarly peers and rivals. They were the intended readership of his miscellaneorum centu centuria prima. So from, for Cray, for Vincenzo Ferra and other, Poliziano might have spared the most interesting <clears throat> information 
that he had collected in his personal notebooks and gave to his audience only a part uh, of it. Uh, or second option by Ferra, uh, used this information for uh, advanced courses, which he held for two, three people uh, uh, only, uh, as it was the case for his course on uh, Suetonius. Uh, we come back to our uh, to our uh, so this uh, translation this manuscript Strozzi uh, it's not surprising uh, in the sense that uh, this was the average level uh, of Greek uh, courses which were open to a varied uh, mixed uh, audience. Um, and uh, it was indeed exceptional for students to have uh, copies of uh, the Greek uh, text, um, also due to the dimension uh, of these classics, uh, uh, pages and pages. Um, for instance, uh, um, some of them uh, succeeded in providing themselves with uh, partial copies, uh, a book of the Odyssey, two books of the Iliad, and, and so on. But it was not the majority of the students. It was, uh, of course, uh, there, there were no uh, um, availability of Greek scribes uh, uh, for, uh, or at least for uh, affordable prices. So uh, this was the average level of teaching, and this is the average type of student notebook, at least for the Florentine context in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, a teaching based mainly on the comparison of the text with the translation, with already existing one, possibly, and a commentary based on general notions of vocabulary, etymology, a bit of grammar, uh, some notions, not many, of rhetoric, mythology, history, uh, parallels with other, uh, with other uh, texts. So a scarce, a scarce focus on, uh, on historical grammar, no critical attitude to the textus receptus. We don't, we don't find here uh, varie lezioni, if, if not a very few. We don't find here philological uh, annotations on, on passages, uh, attempts at corrections of the uh, re received texts and stuff like that. And, and, and of course, we, we, can, we, have to, uh, we have to say that even uh, uh, Polizianos, courses uh, um, show a scarce, a scarce degree of original elaboration on the text, on its philosophical, ethical uh, message. Uh, but indeed, and then I pass to the conclusion, what, uh, what, we, should, uh, what we should understand is that uh, the major part or a good part of the audience uh, did not really aspire uh, uh, to, a, uh, to a complete knowledge, uh, to a mastery uh, of, uh, of the Greek language. Uh, and that's something we can infer also from the uh, prolusiones, uh, the introductory speech to many university courses. Studying Greek uh, is presented as an um, auxiliary uh, study for Latin. Uh, in order to become a proper Latinist, we have to study some Greek. Mm -hmm. This is also true for uh, later periods. It's, it's um, the, the very same thing we read in the Prolusiones by Bonaventura Vulcanius, for instance, in the one he delivered in 1598 when he took um, possess of his chair at the uh, newly founded the, uh, um, University of uh, uh, Leiden. So, um, 
And uh, at the end, uh, what to do with such materials, with such, uh, uh, with such uh, notebooks? Uh, first of all, uh, some words on typology. And yesterday, many colleagues, almost all the colleagues who uh, had uh, their speech, uh, yes, who delivered their speech yesterday, talked about uh, typology. We can use, uh, of course, we can apply uh, this typological. Uh, this typology for the analysis or for the catalogation of our uh, of the notes in this notebook. There are interlinear. We, we can we can of course divide these notes between interlinear and marginal. This these two uh, options, exegetical options, indeed reflect a different kind of interaction with the text because in the interlinear you mainly have reformulations, synonyms, alternative translations. In the margins you have uh, again other definitions, more uh, profound, more detailed definitions, and then you have the logisimiles, and then you have occasionally lexicographical uh, clarifications. Uh, but the margins are always are also uh, deputed to uh, some notes that I would uh, uh, catalog as aid memoir. Uh, uh, this is notabilia, which is which are uh, either uh, made by uh, one single word or are uh, developed into uh, larger uh, sections. Mm, there are no grammatical explanations here. No varia lecciones. I I already I already uh, said uh, this. Of course, uh, our typology also comprehends. Uh, uh, visual elements. We've seen that uh, here too we can find schemes, diagrams, uh, stretches, uh, manicule, uh, underlining this uh, or the other particular passage. Um, it would be it's a bit difficult to uh, talk about or to distinguish between second first and second order notes, because uh, most of the notes uh, were made by the same hand. Um, of course, some hints, uh, when we are lucky enough, uh, are given by the fact that uh, Vespucci or Netucci puts also a date. Uh, we have seen that note of on uh, uh, Cesare Borgia, 1502, there's another note pointing at 1498, so four years after Poliziano's uh, passing, uh, passing on. So uh, that's a question uh, I will be uh, leave uh, aside because, uh, um, because of the fact that uh, it's a very long time I do not see the manuscript De Visu, huh? because there are also a difference, uh, uh, slight difference in the ink uh, color. But the other question is, or oh, the main question is, what to do with such materials? Are they worth publishing? I would say at least to some extent, uh, yes, indeed, uh, for this specific case, if not from the standpoint or the point of view of the classical philologists, at least uh, for the historical uh, value in terms of, of personal information on Vespucci, Nettucci, Poliziano, and, uh, and so on, and all the uh, uh, people uh, which are uh, passingly mentioned in these uh, in these notes. Um, these uh, materials, I, I've already seen, uh, said, uh, show that the distinction between personal and student notes is somehow somehow artificial, though not arbitrary in principle. So, what to publish? Only the uh, school notes uh, or the war stuff. Uh, of course, they provide information on the teaching practice. 
even uh, in uh, what I would call an apophatic way, we can reflect on which characteristics that we might think as needed in a typical school book are actually lacking. Eh? Uh, this book does not, uh, does not uh, have. Um, another issue that uh, might be, uh, should be taken into consideration by the, by he was, or she who studies those materials is their relationship with other school books alike. Uh, so for instance, it might be interesting to uh, study these uh, uh, notes in comparison with other notebooks uh, from uh, uh, similar contexts of, uh, of teaching, hmm? other notebooks on the ethics. Uh, but reading and publishing such materials is not much rewarding and surely not lucrative from an Italian academician standpoint. Uh, but it is another question. So what another question would I like to pose uh, to, to end my speech, what kind of addition should we uh, provide or think about for these texts? Should we plan to publish the whole text of the translation plus uh, the notes or a selection of glosses or, or the glosses without the translation, a selection of passages? Of course, a digital electronic sort of edition or database might be uh, the best, uh, uh, the best uh, solution. And uh, I, end my, I end my speech here. It was a bit confused, I guess, but uh, there was just uh, scattered uh, thoughts that I would like to share with you uh, uh, about this manuscript and in general about how to uh, uh, work on, uh, on such material. Thank you very much for, for the attention. I'm a bit late, apologies. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, Luigi, for, for a wonderful presentation, which is was very rich. Um, and, and one of the things that puzzled me is how uh, Greek can be so absent in a Greek course notebook. That was very striking to me. Uh, and I have lots of questions, but uh, of course, I will uh, invite first the audience to, to respond to the very interesting questions that you evoked at the end of your talk. So the floor is open for questions. Martin, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two small questions. Uh, one, uh, um, as a very small one and short one, uh, does uh, quotations as uh, La Commedia di Dante uh, uh, have a link uh, on the page with the text, uh, which is um, on this page, or uh, are there passages um, uh, here just as a database, uh, uh, as you said, uh, he, he kept the book uh, for a long time and uh, uh, and wrote uh, in the, in this book uh, long after. Well, uh, I guess many of these, uh, uh, at least I, I, I've been able to transcribe a couple of these quotations, and I guess they were made by memory. And there's yeah. no there's no real uh, uh, indication of uh, canto or, or whatever. Uh, it's it's difficult to to say or to ascertain whether Poliziano might have uh, uh, referred to this uh, logi paralleli or or it's uh, something that comes uh, from uh, from uh, from Tucci. Um, of course, if you read the Poliziano's preparatory preparatory notes. I mean, I, I, I talk about uh, Poliziano's notes, but we only, indeed, we only possess one handbook, one uh, notebook um, by him on the Greek, on uh, concerning his uh, Greek teaching. Uh, we, we have many more on his Latin uh, teaching, but, and it doesn't, it doesn't annotate these passages, but I think that as, as it always happened, it, it might have been something uh, that uh, he, he, he could have uh, um, could have uh, explained ex improviso. Mm. 
Okay. And uh, uh, do you think is it possible to teach something on the on the Greek text uh, with uh, philological warre uh, lectioners when you when you are teaching on a translation uh, and press you don't know uh, what was uh, the the source uh, uh, from uh, from which um, Bruni had uh, translated himself. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps it's not possible to, to have mm -hmm. some more. So I'm, 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 I'm sure that Poliziano uh, had its own Greek copy in class when teaching because it's, yeah. it's evident from, from Homer and they might have shown it to uh, on occasion uh, okay. mm -hmm. to, to the students. And um, of course, some of them might have a personal transcription of say book one we are lecturing on book one uh but yes it looks uh, awkward to 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 us uh, that uh, uh, a course on a greek author reflecting on a translation does not uh, engage very much with the greek original uh, of course um, and perhaps i don't know whether i i, I I really um, um, replied to your point. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. We can move on to our second question by David Lines. You're still unmuted. Yeah, okay, okay. there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Luigi. Very interesting talk. Uh, I just wonder. Um, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? Uh, with, uh, with the with the manuscript, I can't remember when the last time was that I saw the manuscript. If I if I have, I have to go back in my mind. But I wonder, uh, first of all, whether it might not be quite significant that uh, he's not using the text of Argyropolis, his teacher, who uh, translated the Ethics and whose translation was actually considered a better one than that of Leonardo Bruni. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if that doesn't give us some indication of the approach itself, because of course, uh, Argyropoulos was a teacher of philosophy and Poliziano seems to be taking a rather um, grammatical, historical approach in these notes. So that might be an indication of one of the things that is going on in this. I'm not sure that he was actually, um, whether he was actually teaching the text as in his, um, in his function as a teacher of Greek or not. That might be something to look back on in terms of the appointment because he, he did teach a number of works, as we know, of both Latin and Greek, but not necessarily, I think as um, let's say Greek language and literature. So he was, uh, teaching the physics as well at the same time as he taught the ethics, as you mentioned, um, the, the animalibus as well. But he's not teaching them from a philosophical point of view, but he's interested in, in other things from the ancient world. So that's just one observation that you might want to comment on. But the second one that I, uh, which is more of a question really, is how easy is it in this manuscript which is multi-layered, as you noticed. Um, as you noted, there are all kinds of marginalia and notes from different periods and different uh, scribes. How is it to, easy to separate the notes that were actually taken at the lectures by Poliziano from the ones taken by other people? Can you do that on a paleographical basis or is mm -hmm. that just impossible? Well, thank you very much. Uh, what Poliziano was teaching, the appointment said, the title of the appointment was Rhetorica et Poetica, which means everything. Uh, uh, of course, looking at what he, 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 he wrote, we would say that it, his approach was always a literary, literary, that of a literary historian, a philologist. But indeed, uh, we, have, uh, we have not 
uh, evidence on the real composition of his classes, uh, there might have been uh, another from, from another sources from Battista Guarino. We say uh, we 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 know that uh, a Greek class at some point was in Florence was composed by sixteen people. There were principians, there were uh, advanced, uh, there were Naldo Naldi, who, who is known to, to have no knowledge of Latin at all, and, and was more than 50 at the time. So possibly he just read and comment uh, the text on a, on a very general uh, perspective uh, and uh, perhaps uh, made some point of language or, or, or or, 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 or logic similes or, or, or what else. I'm, 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 it's very difficult to, 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 to reply to this question because the only, the only, the only real witness about uh, uh, his Greek courses uh, uh, we have is this handbook on, uh, on the Odyssey. So, and, and I guess that one was a, was a course really, I would say, uh, aimed to uh, language learning. This might have been in a, a general class, a general course uh, um, on philosophy. Of course, it was, it was criticized by the scholasticists and, and so on because uh, he invaded their, their field and he wrote the, the wonderful Lamia and so on. As to the other question, it is very difficult indeed to separate uh, with uh, I mean, I will say with uh, uh, a certain degree of certainty, because uh, um, of course, some of this, uh, one clue is provided by the ink, hmm? but it's years, years since I do not see the manuscript and I have only this uh, reproduction. So that might be a, a clue. Uh, as, uh, um, oh, my, my first impression is that the handwriting by Nettucci do not vary very much over uh, years, at least in this uh, postilla. Um, so the, the, the script itself uh, do not help, does not help very much. Um, there are, of course, some uh, annotations which can be um, it might be uh, referred to another hand, huh? but um, uh, until I have not um, transcribed the whole stuff, I would not say much more. I would not be able to, to say something definitive of, on this, but thanks. Okay, then we move on to the next question by Natasha Constantinidou. Thank you very much. much. Ciao. Hi, Luigi. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think that uh, I enjoyed very much this uh, case study. I wanted to, two quick questions. One is, uh, I, I missed the very first few minutes, so I was wondering, is this um, manuscript annotated, annotated in its entirety, or does it seem that the lesson stops at some point? And then the second question is, have you had the chance to compare it uh, with similar manuscripts on uh, the same text, uh, because then maybe mm -hmm. we can get more result, uh, more uh, conclusions from that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, it is uh, annotated in its entirety, uh, and it is not uh, it is not um, usual because, as you know, maybe uh, these school books uh, uh, show that maybe, but 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 it's it's natural. Uh, nobody. Well, only in some cases uh, you can find the uh, witnesses of some, um, evidence of uh, some teacher reading the wall, or this is the wall. And they're usually uh, kept on the uh, first two, first four book, and, and the same goes for these works. This might indeed be a clue of uh, uh, less intense reading, uh, and uh, that might. Uh, um, be uh, uh, that might help us in um, in thinking about the the way uh, it, it, the, the the kind of of, of, of teaching so uh, a, a less uh, 
sort of more cursive, uh, more, more, more quick. Uh, um, the, the aim might have been that of reading the whole, the whole stuff, the whole book, and not to focus uh, very strictly on the text and uh, on, uh, on all its, its uh, linguistic uh, philological features. And then the comparison, of course, uh, of course, this is uh, uh, what uh, we, we should, uh, I would, uh, like to to do at least uh, for selected passages because otherwise uh, you get collating uh, <laughs> recollect uh, and and it might be uh, a huge work but uh, yes of course comparison with other uh, similar uh, handbooks or annotated copies uh, uh, might be uh, might be interest and might be producing and uh, of course that's, that's something I was uh, I was thinking about. Surely, thanks. Thanks for this interesting discussion. I all also like the the idea that this seems to be something universal. That there's this kind of beginner's enthusiasm after which the the, the note taking often dwindles away or something. Um, we're going over time, but I don't mind. So I, I suggest you just continue continue uh, with our Q and A if that's okay. Uh, uh, next up is Anne Blair. Thanks so much, uh, Luigi. I'm fascinated by the transmission of these manuscripts. We know that Poliziano's manuscripts were particularly valued by his students. And I think one student accused another of having published the manuscript that he shouldn't have, et cetera, et cetera. So is the greater transmission of the Latin manuscripts a sign of greater interest or why is there just one of the Greek? Can you tell us something about how these came down through many scholarly hands? What percentage of the whole manuscript corpus there might've been originally was trans transmitted in this way. Mm -hmm. Well, I have I have no uh, idea why we have we only have a, a, a manuscript uh, on 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 Greek and and we have uh, several several uh, evidence on on this Latin course. I guess it it's, it, it 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 just happened by by chance I, by accident. I don't I do not have a. Any any clue of uh, things uh, having gone uh, in, in this way for a particular reason? Um, some some of these uh, handbooks uh, uh, were were taken by Petrus Crinitus, uh, and unfortunately now we have uh, all them in the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek. Uh, some of them uh, just disappeared uh, uh, due also to the political events in Florence, uh, as you know. And I, I would not be able to, 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 to say why. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then our last question before we go into our little break uh, by Oliver Boudet. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It is. Thanks. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I have two small questions. One regards uh, the difference between prose paraphrase. So we, you were showing us the example of uh, mediocritas, which was, of course, in the whole ethics controversy between Bruni and Alonso de Cartagena, a major point. And you showed us that it was glossed, not mediocritas, but mediatas. Mm -hmm. And how can we distinguish between an explanation by a Latin equivalent, a synonym, and something that really makes a difference. So is Polition proposing that Mediatus would be a better translation in that context? And is it marked in any way? Is it distinguishable from a prose paraphrase? And my second question would concern, as a marginal note, uh, you indicated that translations from Agoropoulos were generally um, also identified with their author. So it was not just an alternative, but it was pinned down to whose alternative it was. And do you think that was something Polition did in class, um, drawing attention to this alternative and really naming its author? Mm -hmm. Or was that something that uh, Vespucci might have done privately reading the Agoropoulos translation? Is there any way we can tell? These are two good questions. Uh, first one, uh, it's a paraphrase or it's an alternative translation by Polition. In this case, we are lucky enough because in two different instances in the same pages, 
the manuscript uh, mediocritas has been corrected like, with dots. Mm? So I guess, and, and then mediatus is either in, both in the interlinear and in the margin. And I guess in that case, Poliziano might have said his student, if you have a, a mediocritus on your manuscript, please correct it, it is wrong. Mm? I, I, I guess, mm? otherwise, um, a marginale would have been sufficient. Mm? Uh, as to the second question, of course, we cannot, we cannot say whether this Algeropolean uh, uh, alternative translations comes from Poliziano or uh, from uh, Vespucci, but Poliziano usually mentioned other scholars working on the, or having published on the works he was explain, explaining. Uh, in, and uh, it was mostly polemic in, this, in those instances. For instance, uh, you know, in 1488, December, Demetrius Calcondila published his edition of Homer, the Editio Princeps. That very year, Poliziano lectured on the Odyssey, and in several passages, he said, please uh, note that this work is spelled blah, blah, blah. Uh, however, Demetrius Calcondria wrongly spelled it blah, blah, blah. Mm. So it's, uh, it was uh, very frequent. Uh, in other inst on other instances, he, he quotes uh, passages from Argyropoulos, etc. So it was a um, sort of uh, attitude for, for him to, 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 public, to, to search for public confrontation with, with, with other, to, to, to put himself in comparison to, to the others. Huh? Uh, that was a part of his uh, self-fashioning as the, the better, uh, uh, or the best, the best, sorry, the best human, the best uh, uh, teacher uh, uh, on, on the spot uh, in Florence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the great discussion. Thanks again to our uh, keynote speaker, Luigi Silvano, for a wonderful and very rich presentation on, on this intriguing manuscript.